C'est bon, bon Bonjour à tous. We've made it. Bienvenue. Welcome. Bienvenue à cette première session. So welcome to this first session of the fourth forum on territorialized food systems. And this year, we are focusing on the resilience of territorial areas. I hope that you have been able to see and watch all of the videos that we had online on the forums or website. I have seen that there are an increasing number of uh, consultations, but in any case, they're there so that you can watch them uh, in their entirety. And now what we're going to have is a so-called pitch from all of you so that you can be sure that this is that the videos are not to be missed. I am a part of the organizing committee of the forum. I'm also associate researcher at the CNRS, and we bring together a large number of uh, different. Uh, stakeholders. We have a, a former minister, Mr. Garot. We also have, uh, go ahead. So you can see one of the uh, difficulties of this forum uh, and that is uh, that because of coronavirus, we had to find uh, solutions that allowed us uh, to overcome uh, difficulties we had hoped to meet in Bretagne, and we know that everything can't run perfectly smoothly. So we would like you uh, to forgive us for any of these difficulties. Uh, we'll move on to Terre Lean, which is um, a collective in Br uh, Brittany, and um, this isn't we also have for the uh, Ingala Association, uh, which works on uh, fair trade in uh, Burkina Faso, uh, Amar, which facilitates exchanges uh, with Brazil. And then we have a, uh, the uh, groups for uh, agricultural development uh, in uh, Brittany. Of course, if I went through everybody's um, activity, then I would take a bit too long. So I invite you to look at uh, their websites. I uh, invite you to look at uh, um, the activities going on in uh, Brest, in Reims, and everybody has understood uh, that uh, the resilience of their, their associations uh, depends on everyone in society's ability to be resilient. Uh, we have our uh, colleagues uh, who are doing uh, working miracles uh, so that we could meet despite the thousands of kilometers that separate us. So we are going to have a question and answer session here and we're going to have um, a, an opportunity for the speakers to quickly introduce themselves uh, and what they um, do. Most of the speakers have actually recorded videos, so this means that we will have uh, an opportunity to go further into the different uh, topics. We thought that an hour and a half would be the absolute uh, maximum that we as individuals would want to um, have for this discussion. But this is only one stage because we weren't able to uh, bring together all the different people interested in foods in the different territories and we hope that we can do that in the future. Yeah. We, uh, as we're talking about food, we can say that this is a taster um, of what is to come and uh, we will be having uh, in-person meetings in the future to carry on 
with our resistance. We want to be able to have all stakeholders meet in person. So having um, said that, I would also like to say that there are some people that have not been able to join us, but due to the circumstances, they have not been able to join us because they are in court in Brazil, for example. Some people are at the risk of being thrown off the land that they have been working on for years. And I would like to now pass the hand the floor over to Amar to hear about what is going on in Brazil. And I would also like to show a short video on the situation. We have two of the people who are living through this, this situation with us here in the room. Can you hear me? Bom dia, companheiros e companheiras. Estamos aqui na colheita do feijão agrícola. Good afternoon. We are here in the in Carucango, uh, where uh, we have uh, been cultivation in about uh, three or four tons are being harvested. Osvaldo de Oliveira is a, a landless uh, movement workers plot of land. When we came, the area um, had uh, been used previously just for cattle. Uh, and after we occupied the land, uh, things changed. The settlement is a part of the Sustainable Development Project of the Landless Peasant Movement. This is only one of the examples that we have of uh, healthy foods. We produce uh, a lot of different um, foods in abundance, uh, and uh, we produce around one ton a week of manioc that goes to school meals. Here we have uh, the result of a um, process of consolidation over 10 years. So the food that is produced goes into food programs, for example, uh, for f school meals or meals for other public institutions. But even with all of this uh, consolidation, with all this production that has been ongoing, the judiciary has shown just how partial it is and uh, how much in favor they are of the former landowners to reclaim their, their land. Uh, uh, they don't have any social uh, responsibility. They're also re responsible for logging. And the judiciary wants uh, this land to go back to the capitalist owners. Since the beginning, since the arrival of Bolsonaro, there have been many attacks on these settlements. We were uh, attacked in Minas Gerais, in Sao Paulo, we're being attacked here as well, in uh, Paraná. So this is really something that uh, is uh, being uh, spurred on by the government, by the Bolsonaro uh, conservative government. But that means that we are even more determined to hold our ground. There has been I just wanted to 
underline that uh, this resilience, which we all hold uh, dear, requires uh, policies. And um, unfortunately, currently, we have a lot of um, policies that are in favor of private property. Silvano, could you tell us a little bit about what's going on? Good afternoon. It's great to be with you. My name is Silvano Leite. I I work in the Sustainable Development a Project of the Landless Movement. Just, uh, I just wanted to point out that you can all hear the different languages uh, for if you want interpretation. So you just have to click on the globe at the bottom of the screen. So, as I was saying, my name is Solvano de Leite. I am uh, on the Oswaldo de Oliveira uh, project in Rio de Janeiro in Macaé. And there are um, uh, hundreds of us now working on uh, the harvesting of the growing and harvesting of a different. Uh, organic foods, including beans uh, and manioc uh, and squash. And we're working collectively. There are 163 families that live uh, as a collective on these lands now, which is the 25th of November. There will be a court case which uh, will lead uh, to our uh, eviction from the land uh, so that the, the land can go back to its former owners. Uh, and we are here at uh, the heart of the battle. We are here in uh, court because otherwise we will be just thrown out on to the streets. We will have nowhere to live, we will have nothing to live on, and we will have our right to produce healthy foods taken away from us. So we are here resisting so that we can stay here on the land. We are here on the land of the Osvaldo de Oliveira, land. Uh, so we wanted to denounce the injustices here in Brazil because of the Bolsonaro government who has uh, always threatened us, he has treated us as terrorists, and the only thing that we are actually doing is producing healthy foods and uh, working against the agribusiness mentality. So um, I just wanted to um, say that uh, uh, because I would like to ask for your support. We need international support from all our partners. Uh, and I would like to thank Emma uh, and our colleagues from France and Spain who came here and visited our land and could see what we do in practice. Thank you, Silvano. I hope that, that you were able to follow what Silvano had to say. Now we'll move on to another country that is quite different. Uh, we will have uh, Dominique Barjol from Switzerland, from the University of Lausanne, who will introduce herself. And then uh, once uh, she has uh, introduced herself, I'm sure you'll be compelled to watch her video on YouTube. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great opportunity uh, for me 
to take part in this very interesting forum. Yes, I uh, recorded a short video to present what is happening in terms of resilience in the food system in Switzerland, um, taking into consideration the food sovereignty. Uh, and autonomy in Switzerland. Uh, at the beginning of the video, I speak about uh, the process of direct uh, democracy, which allows citizens to have their voices heard uh, and uh, they can change things as long as they have a large number of uh, signatures. Um, it's 100,000 signatures that you need, so that can take a few months. But uh, since uh, 1848, uh, we have had uh, 310 uh, votes, popular votes that have been uh, taken forward and 20% have been on agriculture. So that's actually the most dealt with topic. And then recently in 2017 and 2018, we voted on food security and food sovereignty, which uh, is, uh, of course, against uh, all um, free trade. So first of all, we worked on food security, and then the year after that, uh, we worked on uh, food sovereignty. We had uh, with food security 78% in favor, and uh, sovereign, food sovereignty only had 60% in favor. In other words, um, food sovereignty meant there would be, uh, res that we were asking for restrictions that were far greater. It's interesting, however, to see this, and we have worked on another very relevant topic, that is the use of pesticides. That will be in 2021, and it goes, takes us to the issue of resilience. Um, I carried out some research on the resilience and how the ag resilience of agriculture in a small Swiss canton of Vaux and how it's dropped. And we've seen that Switzerland isn't as resilient as it may seem, and that many of the indicators that you will discover According to several indicators that you will see in my video, we have a very low score in terms of resist resilience. So we're not very well prepared to resist to all of the different shocks. So uh, in five dimensions, the uh, food system in Switzerland isn't very resilient. And we have seen that the current crisis has um, highlighted many of the issues. And there's a lot more uh, direct sales and the direct links between farmers and consumers. So these are the main points in my video with regards to the resilience of farmers. And a last point that must be mentioned here is that the crisis has had political impacts on the political discussion with our two initiatives to reduce the use of pesticides and finers, farmers sorry, have managed to um, um, push back the time to vote this. We wanted to vote on this initiative uh, in the spring, in autumn, sorry, but it was pushed back to next summer, 2021, because uh, uh, the political ambience is to ensure supply and uh, they were feared that if we restrict the use of pesticides too much now, we may not be able to feed our population. So it's been pushed back to the summer. And obviously, I would encourage you to watch the video. Thank you so much, Dominique. And just to add an extra argument, um, Dominique was the director of the Swiss Winery Association. Um, if uh, we are going to now stay in Europe and we'll give the floor to Terry Marsden from the University of Cardiff, who will be telling us, giving us a presentation. He is a highly recognized researcher on food systems and he will be talking to us today about a proposal brought to the 
Welsh Government on the Welsh Food System. The floor is yours, Terry. Thank you, uh, Gilles, and uh, apologise for having to speak in English uh, and not Welsh or French. Uh, um, my limitations. Um, it's a very great pleasure to be here and uh, look forward to meeting everybody in, on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, I think our Brazilian colleagues uh, already have demonstrated the real need for international collaboration, by the way, um, and solidarity on what is uh, a report came out yesterday on uh, global land grabbing um, and the decline of small producers, uh, which is continuing. Anyway, let me tell you a little bit. I've produced a video and documentation on um, a Welsh perspective on this uh, subject, on which I've been working and have been very active over uh, a number of years. Um, I think it's true to say that uh, in Wales, we've been very innovative in the last uh, few years. Uh, we've indeed created a statutory law, the Future Generations Act, which is broader than agri-food. It's actually a, a wide, uh, holistic approach to future generations and embedding sustainability as a basic principle in all government uh, policy making. And it's uh, still quite unique uh, around the world. And it's still unfolding. Uh, it was uh, enacted in 2015. Uh, and uh, uh, the food system is very much a principal part of that. And uh, you will see in my video that we've been involved in trying to align the Future Generations Act and its associated policies in Wales with the food system and food system transformations. Uh, in, in Wales uh, and the UK. I think there are three issues that are interrelated here that I talk about in more length in the video, which I will just raise here as starters. Uh, three interrelated uh, avenues of work that are needed in policy development. The first is transformations in agriculture itself. Uh, I, and I think a principle here again is about diversity improving and renewing diversity of agricultural systems, not least in agroecological systems. And we're proposing uh, uh, stiff targets for the growth of, of agroecological systems within the production base. Uh, we have an opportunity here with uh, coming out of the Common Agricultural Policy, actually, uh, if we want to take it on that basis, come, come the Brexit issue. The second problem, which has grown significantly in the last 10 or 15 years across the UK, has been food poverty and uh, food deprivation and uh, poor diets and the health consequences of poor diets. It's appalling, really, that in the most advanced countries in the world, we're experiencing food poverty of the order that we now do um, and the growth of things like food banks and uh, diet related uh, illnesses has meant that the food consumption sphere is a, a significant element for urgent action um, over the next uh, uh, few years. The third aspect, which often gets overlooked uh, in our view, particularly when one talks about the growth of short supply chains and a more diverse set of supply chains and production systems and consumption systems is what we call the missing middle. Um, the need for new forms of infrastructure, not just physical infrastructures, but uh, social and digital infrastructures, which can create uh, a more diverse set of markets. Uh, what's called in Brazil, for instance, uh, nested markets, development. Uh, and we take some very good examples from the Brazilian, Brazilian uh, experience in terms of realigning lining public procurement with with local food production and agroecology but we need infrastructure and one of the aspects in our reports and work in in Wales is to think about how we can develop physical and digital and social infrastructures new markets new channels 
in order to diversify the whole system away from its very concentrated nature in terms of agro-industrialism and uh, corporate retailing. Uh, and therefore, the future, we think, uh, for a more resilient future, uh, farming and uh, food system, is to diversify not only the agricultural base, but also the supply chains and the consumer offer that we can need to work with. So this is an urgent agenda for the next decade and a critical agenda for helping to deliver not only on food systems, but also in terms of the SDGs uh, and indeed the uh, future generations policy that we, we've enacted here. Thank you. Mer merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Terry, for giving us those uh, ways at which uh, to put them into practice. We need policies, and for this, we have Guillaume Caro with us, who comes to us with a proposal which is very much aligned with Terry's presentation, which is um, universal. Uh, a law to fight against uh, food waste. And thank you for being with us, Guillaume. The floor is yours. Uh, please uh, turn on your mic, Guillaume. Sorry, apologies. I was greeting each and every one of you, and I was saying how what a big pleasure it is for me to share with you. I am Guillaume Garot. I'm a member of parliament from a French department in the west of the country. I was Minister of Agriculture, Regional Minister of the Agriculture, and I'm also the chair of the National Council, the National Food Council in uh, France. I will go back to uh, your question, Jean Maréchal, immediately, but first, since we're talking of resilience, I'd say that one of the challenges we have to deal with is uh, our fight against food waste because. We, our world is um, using up all of the natural resources without adequately feeding all of the humans living on this planet. Figures are terrifying and we are throwing away one third of the food we produce. So one third of the global food production ends up in the waste bin every year. And it's true for everywhere. It's true in France, in Brazil, it's true in Wales, also in Switzerland. So it's a huge global food challenge we have to deal with. And in France, we promoted a law against food waste. We want to have a public policy in France against food waste, and we want to uh, allow everyone to eat. I'll go back to this in a second. But first and foremost, what we must do is to stop throwing away the food we produce. Um, it makes non no sense whatsoever to produce food and then throw it away. So that is why we have to think about our future food systems uh, in light of this food waste. So we have to do everything we can in all chains of the production chain from the production to the consumption to drastically reduce this food waste. And since Jean Marichal, you are ask, asking me about access to food for all, well, today I very often ask myself about how we can guarantee in developed countries uh, like France, which is the sixth economic power, but there's never before been as many poor people in the country. And with the COVID crisis, we are seeing uh, the long lines of people waiting in food banks. They have never been as long as they are now. So how can we get everyone to eat three times a day? It's a question that I raise very often in the public discussions in France. And what I was propose is that we need universal food coverage. It would be like the idea of a food social security scheme. I mean, 
food isn't a commodity as others. It's a fundamental right. And to guarantee this right, we need to work with everyone. We need to mobilize all of the political levels, not just at the state of the level. We need to work with local municipalities because having access to food when uh, you're a French citizen or when you live in France um, means that school children must be able to eat a meal in their school canteens and they can't be excluded from the school canteens just because their parents can't pay. So in all municipalities, in all of the towns and cities of France, we need solidarity rates, social rates, so that every child can eat the school canteen. And if we take it a step further, this is a concrete step, but if we take it a step further, as you will be able to see in my video, during the COVID crisis, there were food vouchers, food vouchers to buy food, which were distributed locally in municipalities. Also, the state gave out uh, food vouchers for the least advantage. Well, that's great. But I think in the future, we need to find a way of not just guaranteeing the right to food through this monthly aid, but it, this aid must uh, be given for good quality food produce. And the agroecological production modes, um, you know, local sourced food with, without using pesticides, an agriculture that doesn't plunder the uh, Earth's resources. We need to be in a virtual circuit and we need to help our planet. We need we, and resilient policies and that is what I want to um, get in our country and we need to give food aid so that everyone can feed every day, eat every day, yes, but we also have to ensure that um, this goes hand in hand with the general policy to uh, take care of our planet. That's all what I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Guillaume Garo, uh, for your strong convictions and next we will move on to our friends from Brazil and Argentina and these uh, food vouchers should be can and are in fact given out for good nutritious food. It's only at an initial stage but it exists and I will give the floor to our next panelist who can tell us about their experience in Curitiba in Brazil during the pandemic. Please go ahead. Thanks, Gilles. Good morning, everyone. I'm Moacir Darot. I'm a researcher and professor at the Federal University of Pará. And I also work in an agroecological agric center in the south of Brazil, Curitiba, which is a city of almost 2 million inhabitants, and it doesn't have uh, rural areas, so it means we are completely dependent on the peri-urban areas, that's an important point. And I would like to thank Gilles for the invitation and his whole team for this the wonderful work they've put into organizing this webinar. So for those who are watching us, I would invite you to take a look at our video where you will learn about the experience in the metro metropolitan area of Curitiba. Uh, we are uh, there are around, here in the region of around 1,500 agroecological uh, product, producer families. This represents 6 to 7 percent of food producers. It's quite a, an important figure because in Brazil, globally, there's less than 1% of food producers who are agroecological. So uh, having 6, 7% in the region of Curitiba is great. And there's been a lot of work done in the local authorities through public policies. We have very powerful and strong public policies. And the secretariat who is in charge of uh, mediating with 
these farmers who are in the agroecological network to and they are organized in cooperatives to deliver food to school canteens there's also a program for the purchasing of food these are programs to um, supply food to people living in vulnerable situations so these are the main points that i discuss in the video that i wanted to share with you and these two government programs are very important especially in the current times of inequalities the social issues that are brought on by the crisis um, um, we for nine months with these problems and um, uh, a whole set of food producers who were in lockdown for six months it's an extremely long time and it's very difficult for family farmers to be in lockdown for six months and now after nine months we have uh, we've rapidly moved into the second way there have been 160,000 deaths in brazil six million infections so obviously there are many problems brought on by the crisis and it's important to mention also that we have social policies right now in brazil i mean the government the federal government is very supportive and in brazil in the different states we have governments which do good things um, local government especially more importantly because it is uh, all of the good initiatives are coming from these local governments and we also work on social justice programs which you will see in my video another important thing is to link these programs link health and food we are we have the peri-urban area in curitiba where the water uh, there's a lot of water and in brazil there's a strong problem with drought but in Curitiba, for instance, we have hold 30%. Um, the water levels is at 30%. And we, yesterday, for instance, I didn't have any running water at home, and this is a big problem. Yes. Um, if you allow me to put some pressure on you, yes, um, to conclude. I think it's important to have the support of social movements because all of these movements who show solidarity and resistance. Magnifique vidéo de, de Moissir qui parle aussi de choses très très concrètes, hein, comme par exemple le fait que pendant la crise. You see, if you watch this video, you can see that during the crisis, uh, the budget, the can, school canteen budget, it was uh, then put to uh, food baskets. Uh, that's the kind of flexibility we can only dream of in France. So we will move now to Burkina. We will cross the Mediterranean, and uh, we have Sulama with us, who will give us a, a brief introduction. Are you there, Sulama? Yes, sir. Uh, do you want me to show your presentation? Uh, no, I think because of a lack of time, uh, we can do that later, so I'll just speak. So, uh, I was uh, invited to speak about uh, the experience uh, in Burkina Faso and um, this for the interruptions to the food system. I has to say uh, this has been a rather macabre situation that we face and it has raised a lot of questions. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, to reconsider the 
relationship between people and the environment. We haven't got enough literature on the subject, and so we have tried to contribute to this question because it's very important for humanity. When we look at food systems in Africa, some productive food systems in Africa, what we see is that we are being strangled by a climate change, and we know that there are projections saying that we will face food crises, and this weakens African populations, and it also makes them increasingly exposed to the pandemic of COVID-19. Having said that, in our systems of production, what we see, and as was said by somebody before me, there is a huge impact on biodiversity. And biodiversity is what produces, which gives food to people. It allows us to have a very diet, and it means that they are more resilient. And none of this is possible when we are living in crises. And this has been even more starkly highlighted because of the COVID-19 crisis. So because of lockdowns, many people could not leave their homes. There was no assistance given by the state. And there were crises, water crises, and there, for people were forced to stay at home, but they didn't receive any assistance from the state. And this creates a lot of problems. So, so what um, is the state of uh, biological resources? Uh, how can we overcome, how can we, how can we use this uh, in uh, times of crisis? Uh, how can we better, uh, how can we use our resources better so that we can increase people's resilience? In the, in the health crisis, we need to look at all of these aspects so holistically, because uh, sometimes food is also a medicine. We have different kinds of foods that uh, can give us different types of resilience to shocks. Right now, uh, we had hoped to, to carry out some, um, carry out to some research uh, with some funding so that we could have um, figures and so that we could understand uh, how we could increase our people's resilience. But unfortunately, we were not given the funding. When we look at uh, the food systems in Africa, what we see is that uh, uh, we didn't end up in uh, the uh, chaos that we thought. The WHO said, uh, given the uh, weakness of the African context, we would end up with uh, catacombs because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But that isn't what happened. Why is it? Is it because of uh, the type of food that uh, African people are eating? Does that help to make them more resilient? What about the food system? The way that people organize themselves to produce, to uh, distribute, and to put food on the table, it's not a system that should be globalized. So we should allow people to have their own different food systems. And as was said by a previous speaker, that is where community resilience lies. It has to be an ecological, a socio-economic resilience. And that is why we believe that when we accept that the food system uh, adopted by rural communities in Africa is one that is diverse and that uses biodiversity. We have a coexistence amongst populations, we have a diversity of cultures, uh, people can use uh, different crops, the people feed themselves using different crops as well, and because of this diversity it means there are different varieties of crops, and this cannot be, be allowed to be crushed by the globalized food system. 
we believe that the current globalized food system is a crime against humanity. So we need to protect the local and rural food systems against the large multinational nationals that, that to use pesticides and so on and so forth. And it is that way that we will be able to increase our resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Sulema, for giving us these uh, thoughts because uh, sometimes we can be quite pessimistic about Africa, but you uh, have shown that uh, there was a certain level of resilience in the light of this crisis in Africa. Now we also have uh, Leila Xavier from Brazil, who is going to introduce herself uh, very briefly. She is uh, the artist of the meeting. She is a filmmaker. Please, Leila. Good afternoon. My name is Leila Xavier. I am a representative of Conexão as Artes. I first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to take part in the fourth edition of the forum focused this year on resilience. And I would also like to thank Ama for giving us, as Brazilians, the opportunity to meet internationally and speak about the problems that we are living through here in Brazil, either in terms of the struggle, the agrarian struggle, or to talk about education or the issues that different areas that are living through. This is uh, a different world with uh, different stakeholders, but this is the way that we can create networks so that we can be heard. So it's very important that we have this initiative so that we can extend our networks. I took part in the previous editions of the forum and it's very important that each year we can broaden this network uh, because we here in Brazil are living through the constant attacks by the Bolsonaro government, as was said uh, by our colleague from the Oswaldo de Oliveira project. And that is something that we are living through. Uh, we have, uh, we see that uh, education, uh, indigenous people and rural workers, to name but a few, are being uh, attacked by the government. So it's a really um, great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Leila. So I think uh, we have uh, gone almost around the world. Uh, so we will go a bit further south going to Argentina, to Clara Graviotti. Clara Graviotti has not just um, recorded a nice video on what is happening in Argentina, but she's also going to talk about um, a food card to fight against uh, problems with accessing food. Thank you. Clara, do you want to, me to show your presentation? No, I will do it. Yes, sir. so I was speaking about the different uh, the situation in Argentina and I presented food support to vulnerable populations and the different policies that were implemented in Argentina. I would just like to point out that there are 
context-specific uh, points that uh, need to be taken into consideration. So in to December 2019, there was 35% uh, of the population that was under the poverty line and 30 and 10 percent of the population that was unemployed so in september 2020 we had 41 percent poverty and 30 percent of households um then the new government launched the food program to fight hunger and it was presented as the government's most ambitious plan to try and uh, deal with hunger. And so they created a food card, and this was distributed to, to um, hundreds of families. Uh, and this strengthened the social and solidarity economy and family farming. This uh, card was then uh, replaced. Uh, Eight million people asked for help for food this uh, for, in December last year, and this has grown hugely this year. But who are the people using the card? Those are the people who, those are parents who have children under the age of six. Uh, and also uh, for pregnant women uh, uh, who are three months uh, pregnant and people who are unemployed. Uh, so this is a card that is aimed at specific groups of people and there it was uh, also aimed uh, it was unfortunately not uh, was it was not also aimed at uh, retirees pensioners so what was uh, the plan before the pandemic we had argentina against hunger and uh, you could only buy and you had uh, many things that were excluded you had many things that were included before the pandemic, such as cleaning products. Now you can only buy um, foodstuffs. And because of the pandemic, there was also a problem in getting the card because before you had to go and collect it. So not everybody to everyone um, could get the card during the pandemic. Yeah. At the beginning of the plan, two-thirds of purchases were made uh, for um, fruits and vegetables, meat and milk. But now this has dropped to 50% because of the cost of food and also the decrease in income. So families are buying cheaper foods. What are the supply routes? So there needs to be a link between family farming and the social economy, because at the first, at the, during the first step, there were local markets that were set up, but because of the pandemic, these markets were stopped. But importantly, the card can actually be used in shops if they have the great card reader. Now, this is um, a problem for small-scale farmers who would normally sell directly. The problem right now is to formalize uh, these small-scale farmers. Uh, one of the possible solutions would be 
creating cooperatives. So we also have other challenges for family farming and the social economy. As I said, there is um, uh, the lack of formalization. In fact, uh, we are not as organized as our neighbors in Brazil. There is a support mechanism that is planned. And we also have the idea of creating shops, local popular shops. And we also have to overcome logistic issues, but I think that the most important is that the stakeholders organize themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clara. I suggest you look at the video. I will now open the floor up. I am a little bit embarrassed um, because uh, we don't have as much time in this format as we would for uh, questions. But uh, let us hear from, let us hear which question has come up several times. Yes, Gilles. So there were some questions in the YouTube chat. There wasn't one particular question that came up several times, but I can ask one of them, which is the law against waste. The question is as follows. The law against food waste allowed, has that law allowed uh, large-scale producers to avoid having to deal with overproduction? Was it addressed to anyone specifically or just general? No, it was general. Okay. Good evening, says Evelyn. Going back to the could you repeat the question, please? Yes, it had to do with the law against food waste. And the question was whether this law has done anything to um, deal with the overproduction of food. Um, I think that's what I understood from the question, says Dorian. So it's a French law. Maybe this question is addressed to Guillaume Garot, perhaps. Evelyn, uh, we can't really hear you. The sound isn't very good at the moment. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Okay, I was saying um, that with regards to the laws on against food waste in developing countries, especially in Burkina Faso, we do not really think of these laws on food waste are that relevant, even more so because uh, in, here in Burkina Faso, we don't have a surplus of food production. There's a lack of food production. So I'm saying this because when we talk of COVID-19, um, the problem is much worse than in cities than in villages with the whole discussion around COVID-19 and its links to food. The problems are mostly in cities because in towns and villages, food is distributed among family members and food is then kept during the rainy season to be eaten then during the dry season and they don't always have uh, ways of going into the city to buy, so they keep the uh, food at home. 
and it's um, in um, cities that people have to go to uh, shops to get food to keep it for the and the issue of food waste um, doesn't really happen in um, developing countries or very to a very lesser extent. Thank you, says Evelyn. Thank you, Go. Maybe as it's a topic that you work on more specifically, perhaps you'd like to take the floor to react to this question. Yes, um, to add to what Madame Campora said, food waste happens everywhere in the world. It does, doesn't only happen in rich societies. It's an issue, an issue linked to cons the consumption of food, but it happens also, I think, in developing countries. Also, a lot of food goes to waste during the production of the food and also during the um, storing and transportation of food. And uh, I think at a global level, as I said before, one third of global food production is thrown away every year. Uh, perhaps, uh, um, perhaps we should talk about cultural loss also and include it in uh, when we talk of food waste. The question is whether this law isn't uh, trying to wash the conscience of agri-food business. And very often, um, they don't consider the, that some food production systems encourage uh, mass consumption and everything that stems from um, overconsumption. And we must also understand that this law the law that I drafted against food waste led to a greater awareness among all stakeholders, not just consumers, awareness on the need for urgent action and that everyone has to act against food waste. And the law just doesn't only um, refer to food, it sets up a framework to, um, that encompasses the food industry. There is also food waste and food loss during the production stages. So what we do to avoid these food waste and food loss, it's a first step for there to be global awareness on food waste and everyone can take action and we have to go step by step so that our production and consumption patterns are more responsible. The fight against food waste isn't a situation, it's a pathway, and every step we take um, requires us to take small steps that will allow us to change our production and consumer consumption system. Thank you very much. So, in the, among the questions, I see one question for Dominique Barjon on whether food shouldn't be considered a commodity and how um, the agri-food business transnational corporations are very often um, are benefiting because um, food cannot be considered as any other commodity. Uh, maybe Terry could answer this question as well as Dominique. Yes, I think it is a central issue. And it is true that in Switzerland, we did a lot of work on this. I mean, it's about the nature of the food we eat and how can we enshrine into this into our legislation. And there's another point here, which has to do with public service. It has to do with the problem of access to food. It's an issue of food security. It um, cannot be, it can never be solved if food is um, traded in, a, in the spirit of free trade. I think one of the fundamental rights is the right to act food. And therefore, I think 
food and agriculture should be left out of free trade. Um, it is to some extent, but not enough. And there is a big discussion on uh, this topic. In Switzerland, we have direct democracy, but there are so many countries that don't have direct democracy mechanisms. Um, I don't really have a question, uh, but I think at an international level, they should um, discuss this in the FAO and in other institutions where they're now discussing the transformation of global food systems, yes. But if we do not also look at how food is being turned into a commodity, um, the answers will only be partial and they won't be able to really solve the problem. Thank you so much, Dominique. I think, uh, Terry, this is something that you mentioned in the report you submitted to the Welsh government. So what is what are your thoughts on this question? Yes, this is this is an important battle line um, uh, in, in many respects. Uh, the current UK government is refusing to see food as a public good. Uh, it sees it as a marketized good um, compared to environmental goods. This is a bit of a problem. So I think we've got to we've got to continue to to battle with this issue and see food both as a a commodity, but also as a public good, uh, and a much broader definition of of commodity, not only uh, highly commoditized, uh, financialized foods, but but local commodities, as uh, some of our speakers have talked about. So we need a broader framing for food, uh, rather than a dichotomy between market and uh, commodities and Public, uh, public rights here. And this just means, it seems to me, that the public sector and uh, uh, public policies are critical, as we've seen in Brazil, not least, uh, to the food system. We need effective food policies because the markets do not deliver sufficiently. Uh, there's market failure in current markets. We've seen market failures in terms of the waste that's produced, the third a third of waste. It's a wasteful system and therefore we have market failure all over the, the food system. So we need to readjust the, readjust the, pub, the public policies to, to deal with this. This, was, this is not a historically unique moment. We had this problem after the war uh, when, uh, and during the 30s and 40s in, in, in the 20th century when we had to bring in public policies to deliver Food, food rights. So it's not historically unique that the food, food system has to be public policy. But there is a lot of resistance to that. That is one of the major problems in government debates about this issue. Merci beaucoup. Je peux inviter, uh, Thanks so much. I would now invite our Argentinian and Brazilian colleagues, also from Burkina Faso, to share their opinions on this matter. If there are no reactions, I will take this opportunity to read out another question. During the lockdown, we have seen many local creative initiatives, um, especially in short circuit, short food circuit. Shouldn't we perhaps envisage um, other ways of collaboration? to encourage and boost food resilience. And if we can't do this, uh, how do we do this? Um, Clara speaking, in the case of Argentina, we have seen that with the pandemic, those be who come up with initiatives have led to changes. There's been relocation, relocalization processes because there was reduced mobility and also 
thanks to the development of digital technologies, this has allowed uh, us to offer produce from other regions. It's not an easy question. And uh, we've seen many citizen initiatives. They are extremely dynamic and um, we have to find a way of linking these citizen initiatives with the more official channels of the government and we have to strengthen the links between the um, poor communities and family farming. Okay, thank you. If you will allow me, I will take this opportunity after Clara's interventions to say that among the resources you will find a video by, from, by a colleague from the University of Montreal. He's talk, there's a special social network on how social innovation has developed and has come up with new ideas during the crisis. I'll have to give his pitch the, the face because he wasn't able to join, but this session, the video, sorry, is available on the session one. Any other reactions to this question? Or perhaps um, I'll move on to another question. Lauriane, we have a question on the links between different countries. And for Brazil, the question is the following. How can we find ways of supporting uh, collective food production? It's not an obvious question, and the answer is, isn't obvious either. Okay, so who would like to answer this question? Sarah, perhaps? Or Silvano, perhaps? Wait, disculpa. Yes, apologies. Can you hear me, or Silvano? Yes, we can hear you. Good. Please go ahead, Silvano. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we're hearing you, Silvano. Please go ahead. I can't hear anything. I didn't follow the question asked to me. Uh, could you please repeat the question? Yes, the question was, how can people who live far away from Brazil, how can they help to um, preserve the collective food production? Oh, okay, thanks, great. Well, to tech production, there's a big demand on, because of corporations investing in agriculture. And we've faced big threats and problems and we face difficulties to get funding, to, to buy machinery, tractors and other agricultural machinery. So we obviously welcome any type of help, but I think that is our greatest need. And obviously the biggest thing we need to ensure is that people can stay on the land because we need to ensure future for food producers. And in that regard, we also need international support. So maybe letters of support and letters of solidarity that could be sent to the public authorities 
asking for these families to be able to stay on these lands. And regarding the production of healthy food, I think it's relevant to all human beings. It belongs to human beings to live on the land. So um, they could help to support us in the production and marketing of food. And here in Brazil, um, we face many difficulties. Uh, they don't make seeds available. We are having to fight uh, because we have a local bean seed bank and we are also trying to protect other seeds that um, we grow. Thank you so much, Silvano. I see we have two other questions in the chat which um, have to do with what Silvano was mentioning about the lack of communication between Sorry, it seems there was an interruption. Uh, just a sh small technical glitch. So there are two further questions to what Silvano was saying. He was highlighting the lack of communication and dialogue between the local authorities and Brazil and the communities. There are two questions in the chat. What are the means that group municipalities have to um, establish food projects linked to the territories. Another question is, or comment is, the problems have to be dealt with at the local level, not from a national level. So how can local actors, how can municipalities organize to deal with the challenge of resilience? Who'd like to answer this question? May I answer, says Dominique. We don't have ready-made answers. And there's a forum we organize every year, Origin Diversity in Action, and we've seen the same. I mean, I think having these types of exchange and whenever possible, being able to visit different territories, this strengthens the capacities of the territories to take charge of their ability to carry out actions and to mobilize energies that are there. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't happen just in Europe, also in Africa and Latin America. Very often, local communities face difficulties in setting up collective initiatives. And this is something you can learn to do, and you can mobilize things that may seem possible. We have the Biovalde in France, which for 15 years has been developing projects with us setting the example, but there are other communities in other parts of the world that can serve as inspiration to us all. And I think it's important to learn about them and to meet them and to find time to listen to those who have developed this project. It's a learning process and it goes well beyond what you can find in a law on the official public discourse. I think um, we have to hear from these examples. Thank you. Uh, it has to be said that this forum owes a lot to the forum territory on territories. So everything that um, was good, we took from them and uh, all the mistakes were our own. So thank you very much to a forum. I would also like to give the floor to Moisir on this because I think quite a lot of what you do is to create uh, 
these ties, these links within the different between the different stakeholders um, in Curitiba. Yes, uh, I think uh, we need to strengthen the dialogue between uh, local authorities uh, um, and uh, civil society, and this is done through different councils. So, for example, the um, Food Security Council, which the current government has tried to do away with. Uh, we have uh, the uh, School Meals Council, we have different councils, for example, agroecology councils, which uh, works with, with, on family farming, social innovations and agroecology. So it's through these bodies that we are able to have a dialogue between civil society and local governments as well as social movements. Thank you. Now maybe I can have hand the floor over to Dorian. So how Despite the fact that maybe you're all tired, um, do you have any questions? Or? Comments? Comments? Yes. Yes, I have a question. Can you speak? Então, eu só queria assim é, tornar conhecimento de todos da importância. I just wanted foi... to say how important it was to have the support of our partners at AMA. Contribuiu também. France, that AMA that really has helped us in our bean. Um pequeno investimento que a gente fez. And Dos equipamentos necessários, assim mesmo, ainda conseguimos produzir. We were able to produce our crops. Nosso feijão carocando. Six years, uh, sorry, six tons of um, beans this year, thanks to the support that came from Amap and the partners here in Brazil from Amap. So I really wanted to publicly thank Amap, our partners. Merci, Silvano. Thank you, que Silvano. Souhaite, uh, Would any parole? other panelists like to take the floor, or shall we go to Dorian to give us another question? Dorian, over to you. Ah. I would like to say something. Então, um prazer poder participar aqui. Meu nome é Lidiane e eu falo. Pleasure to be here. My name is Lidiane. I am working uh, in the Cereza in Rio de Janeiro on food security and nutrition. I just wanted to say, um, and I'm a bit late on this. Um, about uh, the question on how we could get support in Brazil from the outside. I actually recorded a video on session one um, working with Bern University that were working in, uh, that uh, worked with the uh, uh, farmers in Bahia. So I just want to say just how important it is to have this kind of support, even if it's a small project. But that particular support allowed a training course to be held uh, and uh, awareness raising on uh, food sustainability. And they're also planning on starting other projects. So, even if they're short projects, two or three months only, this kind of project really can help us locally. 
And uh, if you look at, at workshop four, there is the, the cooperatives video. And I, I suggest that you all watch it. The cooperative is called the Certain Forte. Merci beaucoup. Thank Donc, you. je crois que nous arrivons vers I la fin de, de, de cet échange. Uh, Coming to the end of our meeting. Thank you to everybody who took part. We were very international as a crowd. We had people from Wales, Switzerland, Brazil, and even Brittany and Burkina Faso. So before closing, I wanted to make a pitch for tomorrow's meetings. We will have on we'll have a session similar to this morning this afternoon's session uh, and uh, we'll be really focusing on uh, the resilience of a particular food system so um we will be really focusing on resilience and i want to go back to something that was said in the chat uh, it is uh, the well, groups that working at local level that have and are best placed to show resilience and we will have a legal expert who will be able to tell us what the legal channels are so that we can move to food resilience and that being done with the different stakeholders. I thank you for all being here. I hope that there weren't too many technical issues. Thank you to everybody. Thank you uh, to Nicola. Thank you, who's been uh, keeping the conversation going. Uh, thank you to our interpreters. I'm, I'm sure there were a variety of different accents that they had to deal with uh, even